Hello everyone. We are firing things up. Let's make sure all is well. And I need to move you guys to my other screen. That's why you're looking at a picture of a coral to distract you. <laughs> okay, got that done. We can click on, how about, uh, let's see. Move this thing out of my way. Put this right here. We will click this. And hello everyone. Yes, this is live. You are on. I'm hoping volume is working. Am I going to reef a palooza? I absolutely am going to reef a palooza. Well, live stream is on, so give it a second here. Okay, good. We have sound. I uh, wanted to start off by giving you an update from last week. And yes, last week I did a very short live stream. The first time I tried to do one uh, last Saturday, what happened was there was an error 500 on YouTube and I could not connect with all of you guys to do a live stream. Everything was working on my end and YouTube didn't cooperate. This time, and so then a few hours later when we were half done tearing my tank apart, we uh, had a signal and I was able to give you that quick live stream for five minutes. Now I wanted to give you guys the first update. So I will show you, first of all, this picture has been floating around social media. And it's going to come up on your screen in a second. So that giant section of coral came out as one piece out of my reef. And it was a beast of a coral to remove. That's all purple grape Monty as well as the shadow caster acro. I guess that was about two feet by three feet or two and a half feet by three and a half feet. It was pretty big before we pulled it apart. And uh, that guy in the background is Dwayne. He's my friend that I flew in from Seattle to help me with tearing the tank apart. So now before I go, well, yeah. So I'm going to do a full video and I just haven't had time. I'm working like crazy for a big custom order that has to be completed. But uh, as soon as I get that done and in a box and on its way to where it's gotta go, I'm editing video and I wanna get the video out about this and I need to release two more videos about Macna. So here is your first view of the new improved reef, which I know is gonna be shocking and look totally different. Reefing for dummies. Uh, Dwayne is my buddy, and if you aren't friends with him yet, he could probably educate you. <laughs> he knows a lot. He's been in the hobby a very long time. So that's what my reef looks like now. There's a huge difference from what it was. And to be really honest, I'm still having a hard time accepting it, but it had to happen. All those corals you saw in the slide a minute ago, and I'll go back to it. If you look at that giant wall of coral, you could see that there was no light able to penetrate past that to get everything underneath. And so I had to remove that entire upper section, which was basically five colonies. And once those five colonies were pulled out of the way, then at that point, I could open it up. And interestingly, none of my aquascape had to be changed. It was the same rock work that was totally fine that I built in there back in 2013. That part was fine. It's just these dominant corals took over and created a huge shadow. So we'll go back to the reef. And I've got this tied into my phone. There is absolutely no way I can figure out how I can just show you just video without my screen. It seems to be showing the screen on my phone. <laughs> I will uh, apparently have to get uh, some kind of a webcam and that way I can do it. Uh, the nice thing is absolutely nothing died in the process. I didn't lose a single coral. I didn't lose a single fish. It wasn't even dramatic. It was just a big long project. 
Uh, I had a party here last Saturday, and about uh, 30 people showed up that day, and some participated and some just wanted to do what I called it, a viewing party, and they could watch us transition this reef. I shot in time-lapse photography, I shot some live videos, other people shot some video and some pictures and submitted them to me, all for the upcoming video, so you can kind of see what happened over that six to eight hour day. It was a big deal. It was a little stressful. I actually had to kind of put my hands up and walk away and not look at it because I knew I wasn't going to be happy. I knew it was going to be completely different. I like it the way it was, but I also didn't like how much of a wall I had at the top of the tank and how it was just a giant shadow. The, uh, I kept seeing the undergrowth of that big acro that was dead, and all I could just see is that dead skeleton every day of my life. I saw little bits of bird's nest with a whole ball of death behind the bird's nest, and I hated the look of that too. So I had to remove it, and I, I actually got Dwayne in here because that's what he does. He removes everything, he takes out what you don't need, he saves a small little colony to start again, and puts those in key locations, and plans where things need to go. So some of the frags, as Tristan asked, are they in the frag system? Yes, there are a few frags still in there. But of the 30 people that came to visit, a lot of them left with frags, which was all part of the, the party. It was drinking, food, and frags. I should have just called the party that. <laughs> it was really cool to have the, uh, the corals go away immediately and not have to risk them being at risk. Hi, Ashes Reef. This is your first live chat. Welcome to the channel. We are just t catching up on what is going on with my reef tank currently. This is my 400 gallon and you guys are getting a view of it. Only two of the three lights are on right now and one is already in 20K mode. The middle light is in 10K mode, so it's gonna look a little weird. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me bounce back to me and we'll see how long that camera stays connected. And we'll put this on here. If you guys are not part of the water testing uh, project, I recommend doing this every single Saturday. Test your water, post results on Instagram, do hashtag water testing, hashtag post your results at Mila's Reef, and put that on the, uh, on the Instagram so it'll tag me and I can see your numbers and I'll post my numbers and you can see mine. And I've been doing it for the last few weeks and I'm doing it to hold myself accountable. And I feel like if we hold each other accountable, if we both are posting our alkalinity measurements, it's better than they're fine, right? Because that's the problem. We all say, my water is fine when it really isn't. Uh, Mike Shroom asked, what metal halide bulbs do I use? I am using Reef Bright Twin Arcs. And a Twin Arc is a glass bulb about that long that screws in, and it has two bulbs inside of it. And the first one is 10K, and the second one is 20K. John M. asks, if I have any purple Monty frags left, the purple grape, there's a little bit left in my frag system, but the selling and shipping stuff is kind of a beating. Uh, there's no bargain shipping. Overnight shipping typically is around $80 to $90 and because I don't sell corals for a living. If I was you know, shipping out 50 boxes a, a week in, overnight, I'd get a better rate. But since I don't, it's kind of a pointless discussion. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Yoshukai Tony asked if I was going to sell some corals too. So same answer. I, what ends up happening is sometimes, very rarely, I frag and sell corals. And usually I try to sell it to people locally. New school, old school gamer says, do you know Julian Sprung? Yes, I do. He's, um, I, I, I'd call him a friend. Uh, even though we don't hang out, he's in Florida and I'm here in Texas. But uh, I went diving with him in the Keys and helped plant some corals a couple years ago. And I was working underwater next to him, cutting and gluing corals in place. And I was like, wow. I'm working next to Julian Sprung. <laughs> and to him, he was probably like, okay, this guy next to me is handing me zip ties. So what kind of questions do you guys have? Hello from Brazil. Andre, it's really nice to meet you. Uh, I wonder what time it is over there right now. For us, it's 2 in the afternoon. Okay, questions. Black Book Products asks, Why do some tanks with high phosphates have no algae issues? Why some tanks have low phosphates do have algae issues? 
Um, it could be they have a better cleanup crew. Uh, my tank typically has between 0.1 and 0.5 phosphates, but I have uh, hermits and I have snails and they keep it at bay. Um, little Big Veteran asks, I bought a long nose butterfly. I'm leaving him at the shop for a couple of weeks before bringing him home. Any tips or tricks you've learned over the years that may help long term? Well, number one, quarantine that fish. That would be the first thing. And buy the food the fish store is using for that exact fish and make sure they're getting, you're putting that food in your tank multiple times a day so that fish doesn't get too thin. You don't want it to starve, you want it to be healthy. And then when you move it into your tank, continue using that food for at least a couple of weeks, mixing it with the regular food you normally use, and hopefully it'll transition over. Uh, 2MS Julie asks, my BTA, has, my BTA, my bubble tip anemone, has split for the first time. Anything special I need to do or watch for? Well, the number one rule of anemones is make sure they don't get in your pumps. So if you have a sponge to protect against the anemone crawling over it, that would be best. You don't have to do anything with the anemone. It will just crawl where it wants to go. It'll find a spot it likes. You don't even have to try to feed it. But after about five or six days, it should completely heal. And there should be a little mouth on either the side, and it'll eventually become the middle of that new anemone. I am very excited about uh, Reef of Palooza. I haven't been to one in a while. Okay, questions are happening fast. I'm trying to keep up. Um, having high nitrates is okay with low phosphates. Obviously, we want the numbers lower. We have a goal of where we'd like them to be. My tank right now has crazy high nitrates. Uh, it turns out my test kit was telling me, it was not telling me the truth. And because of that, I uh, had to get a new kit and I found out my numbers are high. I've done in the last week a, a total of 140 gallon water changes and two water changes. And my nitrates are still pff, probably 60. I need to test again. Okay, let me scroll up again. I know I skipped someone here. Let's see. Broke Budget Reef asks, when it comes to nutrient export, what do you feel is a better, more sustainable way of doing it? Um, for me, I can sustain it with a refugium. A refugium and a skimmer are the number one, two ways of handling natural filtration along with mechanical. Uh, you could do filter socks, but you've got to change them regularly. And that means every three days, rinsing them out. That's really important. And getting that waste out. If you have waste in the bottom of your sump, pump that out. If your sand bed is really old, it might be time to pull it out. Just like we pull out carpet out of our house and put new carpet in because the carpet is just loaded with disgustingness. Even with frequent shampooing, eventually you just have to replace it. Drexter Istre asks, are you planning any new corals to add to the reef? Yes, I want to add some more blue torts. Um, I've got my eye on a, a setosa, which is another Montipora, but it grows a little slower. But it grows like a mum, which is a beautiful flower. And I've seen it like that before. And I was like, wow, yeah, I'd like that. And I've had a couple of friends tell me they had some frags for me. And I finally have some space on my rock work where I can plant a few new frags and kind of fill that up with SPS on the top. Uh, okay, next question. Do you have any, any anemones in your reef tank? Well, if you're looking at the video I'm showing right now, right under that purple tang, that's a big sea bay anemone that's filled with skunk clownfish. The yellow tang is now right below that anemone right now. He's getting a snack. He doesn't even care about the tentacles. Okay. Mike Shroom asked, do you dose anything for your coral, like fuel or ME products? I do Prodibio. And that's every 15 days. I don't really consider it a fuel or a, a, a microbacter. It's got a, amino acids and it's got, I don't even know what's in it. It's a, <laughs> what do, why are you, you're getting me on the spot and I cannot think this second. But uh, Bioptim and BioDigest are both part of putting fresh, good bacteria in and devouring nutrients. And heck, I'd like to overdose it a little bit to kind of get those nitrates down. That would be great. I do want to start resuming AcroPower. I bought a gallon a long time ago and I just stopped using it. I, I need to, some of my more successful reef keeping friends, they love that stuff. They swear by it. And I think if I hook it up to a dosing pump and just let it trickle in, you know, I don't know, 15 milliliters a day or something for my 400 gallon tank, I might see something interesting happen. Because I believe you need like 70 or 80 or 90 milliliters a week for my size tank. 
How long do you keep new fish in your acclimation box? The acclimation box is my peacemaker and it hangs in the tank for three days. So those new fish go in, they stay in there, I feed the reef, I feed them in their box, and after three days, I pour them into the tank and there's been no kind of squabbling. Okay, I skipped one, sorry. Professional reef keeper, or I'm sorry, professional fish keepers asks, what camera are you using and why? How easy is it to stream? And uh, then he compliments me. <laughs> uh, I actually use the iPhone for everything. And I'm using the iPhone 7 Plus to shoot all my video. I have a special connector that I use for audio, which is this thing right here. And this little piece of, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, 12 inch piece of wire was $26. And then I hook my microphone into that. And that gives me the sound quality that I'm looking for. I am going to be upgrading to the iPhone 10 as soon as it comes out in two months. I'm very excited about that. Andre uh, is talking about phosphate leaching back into the system. If your phosphate gets over 3.0 in the tank, that will create, it will, it'll bind to your rock and it'll bind, your, bind into your substrate and it's gonna be really hard to remove it. And if you use something like Phosphate RX, which is what I use, which is lanthanum chloride, but it's the right dosage. If you use that, you'll remove the phosphate, you'll see the number come down and then over the next couple of days it comes back up because it's leaching back out of the rocks. It's leaching back out of your sand bed. And so you have to treat and treat and treat until it stops coming back. And when I say treat and treat, I mean like every 48 hours you treat again and then 48 hours you treat again. And I've had to do that on occasion over the years when an auto feeder went crazy and just dumped all the food in in one day. You know, it dropped like a month's worth of uh, marine chips, which is that fruity pebbles flake food I like. Dumped a month's worth of food into my tank in one day. And so phosphate shot up and I had to really treat and treat and treat to get out of the tank. Okay. Broke Budget Reef says, I can't sustain a refugium. There's a new product that's on the market that uh, is called the Pax Bellum. And it's this reactor that you fill with ketomorpha and it's got um, LED lights down the center. And that is considered a way of uh, running a system without a refugium because you have a lack of space or there's just no room in the stand. It's a very expensive reactor. It's kind of awesome. I just got to, I went to visit Tammy recently. I am definitely filming her tank as soon as I have the time to get over there. Uh, she just got her Pax Bellum in, and she got the biggest one, which is, you know, I think $1,700. <laughs> the smallest reactor they have, which would fit for all the nice little tanks that I'm sure many of you have. You know, I'm talking about tanks between 50 and uh, maybe uh, 180 gallons. You might have some smaller ones, but all-in-ones don't need it. But so 50 to, let's say, 180. They have a small reactor that was about 450 and that one would grow out your uh, ketomorpha. Some people are DIYing old reactors, wrapping them with LED tape, and they're lighting it up that way, and they say, hey, I did the same thing for $15. You can try. How do I protect my anemones? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me say who said this. Joanna Pearson asked, how do you protect your corals from the anemones? I really can't protect them. What I've done in the past, uh, when I first set up my 400 gallon in um, 2011, I had a couple of rose bubble tip anemones in my reef. And I had all my frags on little rods of plastic, uh, airline tubing, it was about this long. And I glued the coral to the little stick, you know, the airline tubing. And I drilled holes in my rockwork all over. And then I'd put the corals where I wanted them in the tank. And if the anemone got too close, I'd pull the coral out and put it over here. <laughs> And that was my workaround because I knew anemones are going to do what they're going to do. Now I decided, okay, you know, when I set up the tank again in 2013 after it was repaired because I had a leak. At that point, I said no anemones in my reef. I'm just going to have my corals and I'm not going to have to think about it. And I set up the anemone cubes specifically to keep them over there and keep them out of my SPS corals and out of my LPS corals. Well, the sea bay anemone was doing really badly. It was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and it was miserable and it was really it seemed to be a chemical warfare between the bubble tip anemones and the sea bay and the sea bay was losing so i pulled it out of that tank and i put it in the back of my 400 gallon and i said okay you know we'll see what happens and it was in the perfect spot in the back i actually liked that spot but then it moved 
and it crawled all the way around the front of the tank to where you see it right now, which is where that little tiny yellow fish is. That's the giant sea bay. Um, now that little green thing that's just in front of the yellow fish, that's a fungia. That's it's actually several fungias. That was just a little, the anemone was just a little bit bigger than that originally. And now that anemone is like 24 inches by 24 inches. It's a huge anemone. And when it reaches up, it kills the chalice, it kills the LPSs, it crawls to the back, it, it causes chaos. And I just let it live and I try to move corals around as best I can. Let's see. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to the live stream. She said that she got a shipment of macroalgae. That's exciting. What kind? Ryan asks, where do you keep your alkalinity at? And congratulations on getting some zoanthids, your first set. I like to keep it between 8 and 11. And I checked my tank two days ago. I've been checking it every day since I changed the reef. And it is, uh, I think it measured at 10. My notes are way over there. I can't get to the second, but I'm going to retest today anyway, and then post those results on Instagram. So please post your tank results on Instagram too. Remember, you just put all your parameters, and then you hashtag post your results, hashtag water testing, and then at Mila's Reef, and that way I'll get to see your results, and you can see mine. Sarah Lewis says, I just bought a new coral and started to see flatworms, the transparent kind. I just used flatworm exit. The only worms that I see came off this recordia. Do you think I caught it in time? Whenever you get a new coral, it should always go through a quarantine dip. Uh, at the very least, a dip. And coral dips are very easy to do. They take about 15 minutes. And if you can take any brand new arrival and put it into a dip to remove any kind of pests is wise. And when you put it in there, you mix up your solution. I tend to use Revive. There's a coral dip by Emmy Coral um, that I also have on hand. Um, what else have I used? I mean, I've used a lot of different brands over the years. Those are a couple that come to mind. And then I'll take a turkey baster and I, you know, here's the coral and I'm puffing it from all different sides and I turn it over and I blow it off to knock off anything that might be on the coral because I don't want those pests to get in my tank. Now, did you catch it in time, Sarah? I don't know. Uh, maybe. And uh, the clear flatworms, which I call benign flatworms, they don't do any harm. They're, they're kind of opaque, they're kind of whitish, and those really don't cause problems. And typically, if you see a few in your tank, or it's crawling up the glass in the refugium, or it's on the actual display tank wall, I'd say about three weeks from now, you won't see it at all. I have a feeling something eats them, or they just starve to death because they didn't find what they needed. The new school, old school gamer says, what do you think will be the future of captive breeding of marine fish and corals? I think that captive breeding is key. And we already have a lot of corals and clams that are being captive bred or captive grown. Uh, we hear about aquacultured corals. We hear about maricultured corals. Aquacultured is usually the best because aquacultured means that those corals were grown in vats, possibly under sunlight, uh, possibly some places may have a they draw the water from the ocean and bring it through and then send it back but most facilities that i'm familiar with personally they're like landlocked places and they make their own salt water uh, look at tidal gardens they're doing a live stream right now right now too and uh they have to mix their salt water because they're in ohio <laughs> and he's got this huge greenhouse filled with corals that he's growing and the more corals we get from each other the better Obviously, it's nice to get something new and cool that no one's ever seen before, and there are collectors out there in the ocean looking for special corals that are new to us. But you know what? It's not always new. Uh, I mean, occasionally I see something I've never seen before, but I haven't seen everything. I mean, come on, it's a huge planet. But uh, what happens really is we have these corals that become uh, coral du jour, and it's really more like for the year or year and a half, 18 months. And people go crazy over acans. They love acans. And then that passes. And then chalices was the big thing. And I remember when chalices came out. And I have a few chalices in my tank. There's one to the left of that sea bay anemone right there. There's an orange one on the sand bed. If you look a little more to the left, there's a, another one down there. Chalices are beautiful corals, but I have a, a friend who's a public speaker, and he gave everyone a hard time because everyone had a piece about this big. He says, you have like a potato chip, and you act like it's a big deal. He says, show me a chalice. So I raised my hand, like, 
I have a ginormous chalice. And he goes, you don't count, Mark. <laughs> well, why is it that I have a giant chalice and all these people have little tiny chalices? And I know someone's going to turn that into something dirty. But the reason is because I don't frag my corals. I let them grow and grow and grow. If I have to trim something, I'll trim it, but it's not my favorite thing in the world to do. So I prefer to let things grow. But I'm going to try and be better with this new version of my tank so that way it can stay healthy and uh, corals don't fight each other and there's some space between them. Now, to talk about captive uh, bred fish, phenomenal. I think it's fantastic. The more that's done, the better. I think we're coming up on 130 species of saltwater fish that have been successfully bred. And that is very exciting. One of the Macna videos I released recently was the Poma Labs, where they had three new angelfish on display. If you haven't seen that video yet, go find it. It's totally worth it. Those are some amazing fish that have never been bred before. It's super exciting to me, even though it's not necessarily a fish I put in my reef. The fact that we're cracking the code on more and more fish is great since our oceans and our reefs are in trouble worldwide. Okay, let me go to the next question. Uh, Ed's Fish Tank Extreme asks, what part of Texas am I in? Am I in? I'm in Fort Worth, Texas, just west of Dallas. Uh, Ignitros, Ignitros asked, I'm looking to upgrade to a large tank. Any advice on where to find a good buy? Around 100 gallons. Well, I'd say Craigslist is your first bet. You could also look at Facebook uh, Marketplace. And then there are saltwater groups that buy and sell used gear. If there's a local club in your area, there's always people quitting the hobby. They're selling their stuff half price because they want to get rid of it but get some of their money back. And that would be a good place to shop. You can also look at the fish store and see if they have anything used for sale. Some stores do. Or you can tell the fish store, I'm looking for a used tank. Let me know if you hear of one or see one. And they might say, I'm, I'm about to drain this tank and I need to sell that tank and I'll sell it to you for a good price. So there's a few choices for you there. Though, to be really honest, when it comes to aquariums, the aquarium is the cheapest part of the entire project or the entire hobby. It's a glass box. And it's all the other things you put under it and in it that cost you a fortune. And I'd really kind of recommend getting a brand new tank that is, uh, you know, it's got a warranty. That would be best. Do I have my bio, pe bio pellet reactor running even though I have high nitrates? Yes, I still do. Matter of fact, I'm going to top it off. I'm going to fill it up even higher. Why do you ask? Scurvy's Reef gives me a compliment, says the tank looks great. Eh, I think it looks all right. Uh, the colors are changing. I just had a bulb turn off and on right now, and so I feel like I need to go readjust that camera, but I'm going to leave it alone for a minute. I'm going to take us away from it. Just can't stand it. <laughs> Give it a minute. Let it warm up. I don't know. Um, yes, you're right. It did create more space for Spock to swim around, but yet she's still kind of following the pattern she did before. She's not staying, you know, like you think she'd go crisscross and all across the open area. And I am very tempted to purchase 30 Antheas and put them in the tank now to have them swim in that upper area. And I've already put in a, a call for a quote because when you buy a lot of fish, sometimes you can get a better rate. Some of your names are hard to pronounce. C. Dunham, 2978, says, I'm going to start a 180-gallon reef. I'm confused about lighting. What's my recommendation? How many fixtures? What light is the best shimmer and coral growth color? Totally valid questions. It's the exact question every one of us has when we set up a reef tank. And I would say a 180-gallon tank is six feet long, so typically you want three fixtures. Most fixtures are designed to go two foot by two foot. So two, four, six. And I would suggest that. You could use Radeon XR15s. You could use the uh, Kessel AP700. Uh, you might need two of those. One is a little bit too short for six feet long. It's better for a five foot tank. But they're expensive too. <laughs> I'm talking into spending a lot of money. Um, there are other choices. You could get a mixture of T5s and LEDs from ReefBright, and that's a very popular look right now. The reason people like to use T5s is it fills in everything, and then the LEDs make sections pop. But if you do only LEDs, one of the complaints is that you end up with some shadowing because it's pinpoint light, and so you have the harshness. And some light fixtures even create a disco effect, which is unappealing to the eye. 
So it's kind of a difficult choice. Myself, my reef is metal halides and LEDs. It was metal halides and T5s, I'm um, sorry, T8s, is that right? Boy, it's been so long, can't even think what kind of bulb that is. Might have been a T12, uh, what were called VHO bulbs. And I finally couldn't buy those bulbs here in my area. I couldn't find them online easily. And I caved in and I'm using the ReefBright XHOs and they are awesome. They are beautiful. And I drug my feet on getting those installed for over six months and I put them in and every day I look at my tank and I say to myself, wow. Uh, one more thing about LED lighting if you're going that route. It's kind of a magic trick to get it just right. You want the right color and you want the right intensity for the right duration every day. Do not run your lights a long period. Uh, a lot of people try to put their lights on 12 hours a day or maybe even longer. Like from the moment they get up to the moment they go to sleep, it's too long. I recommend that each light fixture is on about seven hours a day. Uh, that's why my lights are staggered. And so the first one comes on and then an hour and a half later, the next one comes on and then an hour and a half later, the next one comes on. And then this one turns off first and then this one turns off. I have a video about it on my channel. Um, about reef lighting, you can check that out. But bottom line is, I'm running each of my metal halides seven hours a day, and that works out well for me. It starts from one o'clock, and by 10 o'clock, they've all gone through their cycle. And it, it works, yeah, it worked great. I mean, look at the corals. Look at what I just pulled out of my reef here, in case you just came to the chat, I'm gonna show you that. So I just pulled that out of my reef um, after about three or four years of growth. David, Mazin asks, uh, I'm just starting to dose Prodibio. Any dosing tips? Do you dose all the vials at the same time? <clears throat> I dose on the 5th and the 20th, and I tell everyone, do it on the 5th and the 20th. <laughs> I just think it's a great date to, for everyone to use, but whatever you want. It's every 15 days, so the 5th and the 20th works for me, and it's what I never forget. And I do dose back-to-back. Uh, now, I use the big vial that's rated for 500 gallons, and I put one in my tank of each flavor. And what I've been doing so I don't just... Now, now I can. I can do whatever I want because the tank is half empty. But when my corals are up to the top, like this picture right here, I was pouring into a cup of tank water, and then I would pour it into an area of high flow so it would really mix. I was trying to dilute it so nothing got hit with one cloud of one single you know, iodine, strontium, um, bioptim, biodigest, Reef booster. I mean, all these things I was using, uh, Vita Coral Vits, that's what it was, the vitamin. All those different things, I wanted to kind of water them down before they hit the water. Fishy Reefer, thank you for tuning in from New Zealand, and I, I'm, I appreciate that you love my channel. Let's see. <laughs> that question was, uh, made me laugh. Let me, I scrolled up the screen accidentally. Hang on just one second. Got to find where I left off. Ah, oh, come on, screen cooperate. Let's scoot this over. Someone said, man, it's just gone. Dave Z asks, do I drink beer or mixed drinks? I do both. I also like uh, Angry Orchard. Oh, I'm, I'm way behind on questions. Twin Turbo is saying hello from Dubai. Can you show us a new space you carved out and discuss your plans for that space? Well, I can show you this right now. The actual video that is going to come out, you'll get lots of close-ups and you'll see a lot more, and I'm going to go into depth in that, and that should come out next week. Bubba Shinobi asks, what cleanup crew do you recommend for clams that are coral safe? I have some hair algae patches, but the astrias and the trochus won't touch it. It could be that your astrias and trochus are old and lazy, and they need to be replaced with new hungry ones. All the snails you get at the fish store are in tanks that have nothing in them, you know, besides some rocks. I mean, they're picking around like crazy. They're looking for food, but those tanks are picked clean. And when you put them in your tank, they're super hungry and they're super active. I would recommend that you have one critter per gallon in your tank, which I know is expensive, but that's how you keep your algae at bay. And when you let them you know, die off in your tank, that's when you start seeing algae growing in your tank. Also, check your nitrate and your phosphate. How do you get the yellow and purple fish, uh, the purple tang to get along? Well, <clears throat> I got a little bit lucky on that one. The yellow tangs and the purple tang, the purple is the one that dominates those three tangs. And the yellows, they're always fighting. I call them Frick and Frack. 
and they're always arguing. I mean, they're totally fine, and then one will just pick a fight with the other one for no good reason. And so the smaller one looks the most beat up at all times, and every other tang in my tank looks super healthy. It's kind of kind of drives me crazy. Uh, Mo Dietz asks me. <laughs> that's a great name, Mo Dietz. He's asking for details. How deep is your sand bed, and do you vacuum it? My deep, my sand bed should be around four inches in the tank, possibly five. Uh, the cucumbers move it, the flow moves it, but it, it started off as four all the way across, perfectly level. Now it's a little more uneven, and it kind of bugs me on my little OCD once it cleaned up. And I don't vacuum it. I never vacuum the sand bed in my reef. I did pull out the sand bed out of my refugium that was five, six years old. It was disgusting, and I was glad I did it. And I vacuumed the sand bed in the anemone cube uh, during the big water change recently because there's so many clownfish and they're pooping, and the filtration is less than ideal on that tank because of its location in relation to the sump. Uh, Nancy Campbell is asking, she has a hang on back octo skimmer for her 55 gallon uh, reef and think about setting up some kind of a refugium or biofilter like a sump, but without the skimmer. So basically you'd be removing your protein skimmer and going to some kind of a natural filtration system it can work but i think every tank should have a skimmer on it i totally do it runs 24 hours a day and it's constantly pulling out something out of the water so if you don't like the sump hanging on the back i'm sorry the skimmer hanging on the back of your tank i would get a skimmer that fits in that new sump you're going to put under the tank hi brian tatkehorst tatkenhorst <laughs> cedric asks can you put color up on the display tank Never, never, never put Calerp on the display tank. I know some people may do it, but then you'll always have it growing somewhere out of your rock work. It is the weed that does not belong in a display tank, in my opinion. Uh, he did say he has a, an island of rock for the Calerp to hold on to, but it spreads. It puts down roots, and you'll end up having the stuff in your tank forever. And when it does start spreading or if it breaks off or if it, it dies and leaks its juices into the water elsewhere, I mean, it's just not a good thing. I don't recommend Calerpa in a display tank. I am running feather Calerpa in my refugium, and I've had nothing negative happen. All those plants stand there. I don't let any of that get into my display. If even a little blade of it shows up somewhere, I immediately remove it, which is rare. I think I've found like three leaves of Calerpa appear in my anemone cube in six years. <clears throat> Northwest Marine says hi. Good seeing you on here. Mike Shroom is saying I'm setting up a 220 gallon tank. Can I get away with a bare bottom or would it be better with a sand bed? And if so, how deep? Sand beds, I think they look awesome. When I dive in the ocean, I see rock and I see sand. And to see a bare bottom tank just drives me a little bit crazy. I, I like the sand bed. I like that there's bugs in there, that there's worms in there, that there's bacteria in there. I know it collects a little bit of waste, and that's what, one of the reasons people remove it. They don't want sand, and they want to have high flow, and they want to siphon out the detritus that they see amassing around the foundation of their rock work. To me, a reef tank is a living biotope. It is not a, um, it is not a museum piece. And so, you know, like when I go to the museum and I see Star Wars props in a glass box, like, yeah, that looks awesome. But... When it comes to living stuff, I, I love a sand bed. Uh, a sand bed between two and four inches is what I like to put in a tank. David uh, Mazin asks, when is the video of the tank rescape coming out? Next week. I've got to finish up a big order for a customer right now, and it has to ship. And as soon as it's gone, I can sit in my computer and edit. But this order has to ship because it has to go where it's got to go because I'm flying after it to go help install it. And this thing has to be done. I did the stream today just because I always do a stream. But as soon as I'm done, I'm going to be gluing acrylic for the next uh, 72 hours or less. Um, Twin Turbo asks, do the red bubble tip anemones move around your tanks less than your current anemone in your display tank? The rose bubble tips don't really move a lot. I've got a couple that are moving, but I've got some that have put their foot down in the same spot forever. The sea bay... It gets in a mood. So when I re the tank, I actually intentionally put dead corals on the back, stabbing the anemone from behind, so it feels that is not the direction to go. And so there's actually this big head of uh, 
dead hammer coral that's stabbing the back. And I call it the stabby area. <laughs> and that way, the anemone's like this, and it feels this uncomfortable thing, and it doesn't think, well, I should go that way. It's going to be bad. And so I, I want it to stay here where it feels secure. And so far, so good. It's staying where it belongs. Okay, let me scroll down. I know I'm missing some questions here. Jeffrey Z3 says he has a soft coral tank and everything's happy, but he can't get green star polyps to grow. They die after a few months. I have happy hammers and torch corals. It could be that the torch coral is stinging that uh, star polyp. Green star polyps are a very easy coral to grow as long as your water parameter, it's always water parameters. But if your salinity is where it belongs, 1.025, 1.026, your alkalinity is around eight or nine, and your calcium and your magnesium are intolerance levels, star polyps should grow very easily. And you don't have to dose for a softy tank. You're not adding alkalinity and calcium all the time. Usually you're just doing water changes and that suffices. So I would look at maybe some corals are stinging the star polyps, or maybe they're in an area that is too much light and they need to be in a little more shade. I try moving some to a different spot and see how that works for you. Renata, I was removing this coral right here from my reef. That's when you were looking last week. And what I was doing was clearing out this massive colony that had taken over my tank because everything underneath was dying. It was in total shade. And that was one of the funny things. So Dwayne was helping plant corals on the rock work after this was out of the way. And he told me, you know, in the evening, can we please turn on the blue lights and turn off this white light? And I told him, okay, why? And he said, your rock is so white, it's blinding me. And it made me laugh because when you think about it, my rock work isn't purple. It's white because it was completely shaded all this time by this massive colony of Acro and Montipora and uh, Stylophora and Chalice. And those four dominant corals just literally hid everything. And everything underneath was just completely without any light. Okay. Scrolling down. Uh, Sarah, about your flatworms, uh, if you can send me a picture of them under normal lighting, not under blue lights. Anytime you have a question, you guys can send me a picture. You can post on Instagram and at Milo's Reef. Here, I'll give you this link one more time. And I will try to identify your critter and see what it is. Also on milosreef.com, I have a critter ID section with a lot of pictures, and you can look at those pictures and compare to what you have in your tank and see if that's what you have. And there would be information about how to remove it or uh, what it is, or if it's something you don't even have to worry about. Um, Ryan asks, other than Zoas, are there any other good beginner corals? And he's got T5s and LEDs, and cold coral is nice, leather coral is nice, recordias are nice. Uh, we were talking about star polyps a minute ago. Those are nice, but they're fast growers and they tend to take over the tank. So be a little careful with that one. I'd put that coral on an island by itself so it can't attach to all the rock work or glue it to the back wall so it grows up. But uh, those are all good, easy corals for a new hobbyist. If you're wanting to delve into SPS, I would say bird's nest. Mm -hmm. I can't say your name. Josue? San Miguel asks, can you use any container from Walmart to hold uh, top off water? I would look for a container that's food grade rated, which means it has to say HDPE on it somewhere. Usually it's stamped in the bottom of the container. That's high density propaethylene. That is a container that is safe to put food and water in that you can eat out of safely and not get toxins. And we don't want to just put our water in any old container. So for years ago, I found this wrapping paper container that held 15 gallons of water and it was rated you know, food grade, <laughs> even though it's for wrapping paper. And I was able to use that for many years with no issues at all. Brute trash cans, they even have small adorable ones. Uh, coolers can work, you know, like the kind you see workers have those orange ones. They have small versions and they go larger, of course. Those are all, you know, used to hold drinks and, and food and ice. Those are all safe. Of course, a small aquarium is always safe to use. But uh, just any container, no. You want to be picky about what you're storing your water in. M. Wilk 19 says that he bought three of the Singapore Angels from Poma Labs. Good job, buddy. I'm proud of you there. That's awesome. 
They're in a 20 gallon tank to let them grow a little bit before he, put them, before he puts them in his reef and they're eating like pigs. That's great, keep feeding them. Make them fat and happy. And that way when you add them to your tank, they're already trained on the food and uh, hopefully they'll do really well. I would love to see pictures of those tiny fish of yours. Be sure you post those up. Um, Lava, S Lava Syst, S Y S T. Sometimes I try to figure out what your names mean. I'm gonna say lava. Uh, he asked if he could add a, a hepat hepatitis tang, Hurricantherus hepatitis tang. I think you're talking about the blue hippo, to be honest. A lot of people use Latin, and I'm so used to the easy words. Uh, is it too big for a Red Sea Reefer 425 XL? I need to know how many gallons that size tank is. If you can reply, I will answer you. But I have a tiny blue hippo inside my 60 gallon anemone cube, and he's been in there for a year. And he's gonna have to move soon, but he is adorable in there right now, and I love it. Nancy, if you want to put that skimmer on the back of the tank and leave it there, yes, that'd be fine. And now we have more room for the refugium zone. DP13 Patel asks, can I use Hawaiian black sand? Is that okay to put in a tank for wrasses to bury themselves in? Just so you know, the Hawaiian black sand it's sand, but it's silica. It's made of glass. There's no such thing as black sand. Um, it's actually crushed glass. So is it safe for a raspberry into? I don't know the answer. Probably yes, but I don't know. So I would do some more research. Typically with our reef tanks, we like to use sand that is aragonite based, which means calcium based. And that's what we use in our tanks. The, I've never used black because I knew it was glass. And then a couple of people are noticing my tank has changed a lot. Said, yes, that is true. And I have a video coming up, coming out about it next week that will show you why and what we did and what the plans are. PM Bautista asks, have I ever used Fauna Marine minor trace elements? No, because normally any kind of product I have to buy, I need to buy it by the gallon because of my big tank. And so I don't. I do have the smaller frag system where I can try things out, but it takes a, you know, a little bit of effort to uh, see if anything has changed. And a lot of times the problem is we change so many things at once that it's hard to say, oh, those trace additives, they made all the difference because you cleaned your skimmer, you cleaned your pumps, you wiped off your lights, you siphoned your sand bed, you, <laughs> you pulled out some pests. Yeah. If you did nothing but just add that and you saw a change in your tank, then you could say that product actually did it. But there's so many things happening all the time. Um, Megan asks, how do you get rid of Aptasia? One of the easiest ways to get rid of Aptasia, and they're not easy, they come back a lot, uh, is to use something like Aptasia X and you, you squirt it over their mouth and completely glue them shut. I uh, have used a laser to burn them out of my tank. I've tried other ways. Right now I have a copper band butterfly that lived, which is very hard to do. Uh, the uh, copper bands tend to, you know, we get them and then within a couple of days they're dead. And it's just, it's a frustrating situation because you want to give it a healthy, a healthy home and you think you're doing everything right. Sometimes they just didn't do well in the first place at the fish store. And I tried several over the years. And this one that I got, I've had it for about a year and a half now, a year, over a year for sure. And it's doing really well. And it's eaten all the Aptasias in that tank. And it's even eaten some of the Mahanos, which is great. Ashes Reef asked, where's Spock? Well, Spock is swimming back and forth across the back of the tank. I've seen her appear a couple of times in this video. Um, why is my tank looking different? Asked uh, SH33L. That's because I pulled out a lot of big corals like this one right here. So I had to do that. There's a video coming out about it next week. Megan, uh, yeah, I just answered that about, is there any fish that eat Aptasia? There's a file fish that eats Aptasia, uh, but they kind of tend to bite onto SPS corals, and I think they might even need some SPS corals to snack on when they're not eating Aptasia. Not 100% sure of that one. Peppermint shrimp, definitely. Thank you very much, Doctor of Welsh Magic. Peppermint shrimp is another good critter that you can put in your tank that will eat Aptasia. They'll pick at them, and they'll really devour them, especially, uh, well... The ones I buy from Frank's Tanks, I don't know why his are better than other peppermint shrimp, but his really do eat them. And it's super handy to have a fish store so close to me that carries them. 
The Bergia and Nudibranch was another thing someone mentioned. Thank you guys, you're helping it. You're, I love this group chat. <laughs> Bergia and Nudibranchs are another creature. They're a little tiny, uh, no, it's a Nudibranch, it's a worm. And they crawl through your tank and they eat Aptasia, that's all they eat. So once they run out, of, run out of Aptasia, then they die. Cedric asks, how do you make a self-sustaining reef tank except feedings and water changes? Well, uh, even if you set up everything correctly and you automate all your gear, you still need a degree of luck and you need continuous power. And as we've seen our poor friends in Florida that went through Hurricane Irma, they lost power for six to 10 days. And even setting up the perfect reef tank, once the power was shut off and they were evacuated from the area, they had to leave. They had to walk away and hope for the best. And very few people came back to a living tank. Some people got lucky. Some people had battery powered gear hooked up. Um, you know, you can't even set up a generator to run for nine days in a row. That's insane. Uh, you can, you know, they typically run six to 12 hours and then you have to refill the gas tank. And even if you have daisy chain gas tanks, you're abandoning your house for a week. Not to mention looters, people that come to steal, you know, they hear power, they're gonna steal the generator, you know? So very hard to do that. My tank is on autopilot. I don't interact with it a lot. I tend to leave it be so it can just grow and be its thing. But I do test water regularly every Saturday and I do water changes occasionally. This last week I did 140 gallons of water changes and, uh, and I feed. So it pretty much is self-sustaining. I don't mess with it a lot. I just make sure all the, the equipment is running properly. All right, guys, we are coming up on a full hour. I want to wrap this up. Let me answer two more questions. Cedric, I can't answer your question about the Triton method because I have not done any homework on it yet, but I'm sure there is tons of good information about it on the web. Dino Fernando, or Dino Fernando says, I'm starting a new aquarium. Live rock is cheap here. Well. How nice is that? Always use live rock over dry rock. I always recommend that. Yes, I know there's dry rock vendors out there gonna be mad at me. That's okay. I've only used live rock in my tank since I've been in the hobby and I love it. I like that there's creatures in there. I like that there's sponge in there, worms, bacteria, pests. I don't care. That's all part of a natural reef. I will just fight the pests that I come across until I get that under control. And the rest of it is awesome. I actually want those things in my tank. And if you do dry rock, because I, I should take the other side of the spectrum. If you use dry, ro dry rock, what ends up happening is your tank will take a long time to get mature in a way where the rock is covered with all the things you like. And, you know, where do they get the things you like? Well, every time you put a new frag in there, things crawled off the frag and onto the rock work. So that's how you get some coralline algae. That's how you get some baby brittle starfish. That's how you might get an Astorina starfish. Um, uh, you might get... Uh, spaghetti worms and these all these little creatures that are part of the natural system they all have a job in the ocean and having those in our tanks i i like them and starting with dry rock uh, it's it's a exercise in patience yes you can glue it all together before it ever gets wet and drop it into your tank and it'll be rock solid i mean pardon the pun but then for the next few months you're going to watch it go through different color phases and it'll turn green and then it'll turn kind of brown and you know then it'll maybe turn a little reddish or maybe all of those colors at once and then finally it kicks in and it starts looking good and that's the kind of stuff i i just don't like it okay that's my opinion i get to have an opinion too Daniel Schneider said, uh, after watching the AP700 Kessel review, do I have any new knowledge or opinions about it? Number one, looks great. I liked that there was a shimmer and there wasn't the disco effect. And I finally got to see the app. And the app was super easy to use. There's a local hobbyist here in my area. And I got to try it out on his phone. It was so easy to control that light. I was very impressed. So I thought the light was great back then. And I, I, I haven't changed my opinion at all. I think it's great. And I really like that there's an app. Doctor of Welsh Magic, bye. Have a great day. Enjoy your weekend. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up here, guys. I really appreciate that you tuned in for the live stream. Uh, as I said before, there'll be a couple of videos coming out this week. As soon as I get my big order shipped, I'm going to do a video about why the tank changed so much. 
and I'm going to do a video about, um, I, I got to do one more video about Macna. I, I hope I can do it all in one. That might be a long video, but I want to just finish it. I gave you guys three parts. I need to do part four and then get it off my hard drive. <laughs> now I got to get back to work. I've got a, a huge acrylic order I'm working on right now. And I need to finish it because it's got to ship out Monday evening. And it's really important to get this done. And it's been uh, a real stressful thing. So thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, if you aren't subscribed to the channel yet, please do. If you liked this chat, I saw people mention a couple times, do a thumbs up. Apparently that helps. Um, and I appreciate all your feedback. If you have any questions, please post them to me however you want through social media, email, uh, under this video now if you're watching it after the live stream. Post your water parameters on Instagram so I can check them out. And uh, I will see you guys next Saturday.